Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer was born in Danzig in eastern Germany in 1788. As a young man, he wasn't lacking in confidence. He argued with the great novelist Goethe and lambasted Hegel, the predominant philosopher of the day. His central idea was that everything in the world is fundamentally united by a will to live. Its two key features are that it is infinite and meaningless and leads to boredom or suffering. The only escape from this, he argued, comes through self-denial or art, preeminently music. This pessimistic worldview carried Schopenhauer's influence well beyond philosophy. His thinking marks the music of Richard Wagner and finds echoes in the work of Sigmund Freud, Thomas Hardy and Albert Camus. To discuss the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer, I'm joined by Anthony Grayling, Professor of Philosophy at Birkbeck College, University of London, Beatrice Han Pyle, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Essex, and Christopher Janoway, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southampton. Anthony Grayling, Schopenhauer came of age in the in early 19th century Germany. At that time, the dominant philosopher in Germany was Hegel. Before we come to Schopenhauer, can you give us a sense of Hegel and his hegemony of philosophy at the time? Well, it's very interesting. When uh, Schopenhauer was a young student, in fact, uh, Hegel hadn't yet made a reputation, but he did very soon after uh, Schopenhauer had begun his own work in, in philosophy. This was round about 1820, I suppose, by which time Hegel was the professor of philosophy at Berlin, the most uh, prestigious philosophy appointment in Germany at the time. And he drew enormous audiences to his lectures and his works which he had uh, published in the preceding decade began to have a great influence on thought in Germany and the thing about Hegel is that he had this tremendous system a great sort of totalising system which purported to explain the unfolding of the world spirit through time uh, and um, uh, criti critics of Hegel's have suggested that uh, what he had in mind was that the Prussian state and uh, German culture of the uh, first uh, half of the 19th century was uh, pretty near the summit of the unfolding of the world spirit. And this is something that Schopenhauer very much disagreed with. Can you give us um, rather more detail of Hegel's system of how the world spirit unfolded? His, uh... yes, the idea is that uh, at every moment, as it were, in, in the history of, of the world spirit, uh, there are internal contradictions to this, the state of the spirit at that time, or the state indeed of anything at that time. And these internal contradictions have to be overcome by a forging of a new and higher version of itself, as it were. This is sometimes put not entirely accurately in terms of a, a thesis, an antithesis, and an emerging new synthesis out of it. In fact, Hegel didn't quite put it that way himself because he thought of these contradictions as being implicit or internal to uh, a given state of things. Um, so the idea is a dialectic, a, a movement forward into time with, uh, as it were, an increasing value, an increasing level of, of perfection, moving always towards this final perfection, which is the full realisation of the spirit in history. Is he talking about the way ideas move through time or the way actions lead to ideas that move through time? Well, he applied this analysis to everything, but, but the, the great um, uh, point of it was this, this idea of what he called the geist, which is the, 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 as it were, the, uh, the, the true meaning of things. We translate that as a spirit, that it's that, it's the fulfilment of that ultimately. But uh, everything can be thought of in this dialectic way, even particular things can be thought of as being in a state of inner contradiction and needing this resolution by moving forward to a higher plane. So if Hegel's philosophy and the power of the, of the professor in German thought, which was massively powerful, and Schopenhauer is never going to be anywhere near reaching that state, but there's also, at that time, there's a burgeoning romantic movement, which is anti-enlightenment. Can you briefly tell us about that and how that played into the atmosphere, or the thought of the time? Yes, the, the romantic movement, especially in Germany at the end of the 18th century, uh, has to figure as one of the major, I suppose, counter-enlightenment movements because... One of its premises was that reason by itself cannot be and shouldn't be regarded as the the, 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 the the dominating note in thinking about things, but that there are other sources of authority over us, as it might be beauty or nature or tradition or uh, sentiment or even indeed the blood of the people. Uh, and in different ways this expressed itself in poetry, in writing, in music, but also, of course, in philosophy. Now, I don't think anybody would willingly be without the poetry and the music that came out of Romanticism, but um, Schopenhauer, in particular, 
tremendously disliked uh, some of the romantic impulses in the philosophy of the day. So he heard lectures by people like Fichte and uh, Schelling, um, and he was very, of course, aware of what Hegel was doing. And he tended a little, I think, to lump them all together, perhaps not entirely fairly, as something which really uh, required opposition because he felt it was moving philosophy in particular in the wrong direction. Christian, anyway, can you tell us about Schopenhauer, uh, his family he was born into, how he became a young aspiring philosopher in his uh, late teens, early 20s? Yes, well, he was born into a um, uh, middle-class family. His father was quite a successful uh, merchant in uh, Danzig, which was a free-trading uh, city and now Gdansk, of course, in Poland. Um, and uh, his mother was um, actually a very successful literary figure in her own right later in life. And there was a bit of a mismatch between his parents, which I think he later came to realise. He was destined for a career in in business, in in trade. Uh, in fact, it's said that his name Arthur or Arthur was selected because it was a kind of pan-European name that which would fit him for this uh, role as a European businessman. Um, his father died uh, when he was about 17, and it's thought that it was probably by suicide. His father was ill and uh, had a tendency to be rather depressed and melancholy, which, uh, in fact, was a tendency that uh, Arthur himself seems to have inherited. Um, but this um, result of his father dying meant that um, over the next few years when he became of age, he was free to do what he wanted, and he entirely gave up the commercial career that he'd been destined for. Didn't he inherit enough money to make him rather ind independent? He did. When he came, I think when he became 21, um, he had uh, quite a large uh, fortune that he inherited. His mother just let him have it and said, quite, it was quite liberal-minded, actually, and said, well, you choose what you want to do in life. Uh, he decided he wanted uh, the scholarly life, uh, enrolled at the University of Göttingen and then later um, moved on to Berlin, as Anthony said. Um, so he really just gave up um, his father's influence. And I think it's been said that had his father not died early on, he might never have gone into philosophy because his father was quite an influential figure over him. One thing we didn't get around to when, when Anthony was giving us that background was the power of the professor. And the, uh, uh, professorships in Germany at that time were they were in extremely powerful, not only intellectual positions, but social positions. Uh, and um, Schopenhauer would aspire to that, and there was Hegel, both a professor and a great philosopher. Can you tell us um, why he attacked Hegel so violently and what he said mm. against him? Right. Well, uh, I think the, the chief word that he tends to use when writing about Hegel is that of uh, charlatan. Um, I mean, anybody who's read Hegel or tried to read Hegel even... Uh, would find that it's quite a difficult read. There's quite a lot of heavy terminology and a sense of um, a certain amount of obscurity in his writing. Schopenhauer thought that all of this was a bit of a uh, bombastic kind of smokescreen for some rather empty thought on the one hand. Um, he also thought that um, uh, Hegel's idea that... Um, by reason we could reach some knowledge of the absolute and that there was this perfection that everything was striving for. He found these notions really rather ridiculous. Also, his thought was very ahistorical, Schopenhauer, non-historical. That's to say, he didn't think that the essence of human beings or of the world ever really changed. So uh, Hegel's idea that um, everything is progressing towards perfection through history was something completely anathema to Schopenhauer. Um, so... What happened uh, to really um, inflame his hostility to Hegel was that Schopenhauer, as a very young uh, lecturer, uh, put on his lectures at the same time as Hegel's. Now, Hegel, as Anthony has said, was the star of the academic uh, establishment, had this professorship at Berlin, had 200 people in his lectures. Schopenhauer had about five, I think, and uh, it sort of petered out, and he basically never returned after one semester of teaching, never returned to his academic career. Of course, he was unable to, to do that because he had this private income. But throughout his life, he was then uh, very contemptuous towards what he called university professors, people who made a career out of doing philosophy. He thought you should be independent-minded and not sort of kowtow to the establishment. Did his attack on Hegel have any effect on Hegel's reputation? Uh, I don't think it really did, not at that stage, because Schopenhauer himself wasn't really read much until 
until about the 1850s. I mean, there were, uh, there were a couple of reviews of his books earlier on, but he didn't really have an audience until the last decade of his life. He died in 1860, and only just then did he start to become recognised as a philosopher, uh, by which time I think it's tr true to say that Hegel's uh, hegemony, his influence, was waning already. And Beatrice Anpal, um, so Schopenhauer, Schop Schopenhauer turned against Hegel, and... The one of the people he went back to was Kant. He was also influenced by Plato, but let's stick with Kant at the moment. What did he find in Kant that was attractive? Well, uh, he particularly liked Kant's epistemology, his theory of knowledge, and the distinction that Kant introduced between, on the one hand, the phenomenal world and the noumenal world on the other. So the phenomenal world is a world as we perceive it through time, space, and as organized by the law of causality. Uh, and phenomena are all the things that are in it. So Melvin, you're a phenomenon, I'm a phenomenon as well. So to take an example, um, I'm sitting on a chair, I perceive that uh, in space as an extended object, in time as something that is here now, and as part of a network of causes and effects. For example, I'm sitting on it because I moved it. So the phenomenal world is really the world as it is dependent on a set of perceptual conditions, time and space, and conceptual conditions, the law of causality. That's really Schopenhauer's version of Kant, because in Kant it's slightly different, but the main uh, distinction is the same. So the question arises of what would happen if these conditions were bracketed. And one way uh, to think about this is to imagine uh, time, space, and causality as a pair of glasses, so to speak, that would be hardwired on us. So everything we see, we have to uh, see as mediated through time, space, and causality. And the question is, what would happen if uh, these glasses were somehow removed? Would it be the case that there would be nothing, that everything would disappear? Now, Schopenhauer follows Kant uh, in saying that, no, this would not happen. What we would have is the world as it is in itself, independently from perceptual and conceptual conditions. Uh, that's what he calls the noumenal uh, world. But just in the same way as without the glasses, we wouldn't be able to see the phenomenal world. In the same way, uh, we cannot know anything about the noumenal world. We can say that it exists, but no uh, knowledge of it uh, is possible. The noumenal world is things like, is there a God, does God exist, things that cannot be, cannot be proved? Yes, well, it's um, rather, it's, uh, these are questions that one, uh, metaphysical questions that uh, could be answered if we knew about the essence of things, uh, and in particular, indeed, whether there is a God, whether we have a soul, uh, whether the world has an end, that sort of thing. But the, uh, the idea for Kant, and that's where Schopenhauer actually differs from him, but the idea for Kant is that these questions are unanswerable uh, because there's no uh, empirical basis on which we could form appropriate knowledge uh, which would give us answers. But Schopenhauer challenged that. That was his disagreement with Kant. Indeed. On what grounds did he challenge it? How well, could we know about the unknowable as far as he is concerned? Right, OK. Uh, what ground? I think it's because he thinks that although Kant secures the possibility of empirical knowledge, in particular through the sciences, that leaves out exactly the sort of questions that we were talking about. And these, to him, are the most important ones. You know, what's the essence of the world? Why is there suffering? What's the meaning of human life? So uh, he f tried very hard to bypass what's often called the Kantian prohibition, the impossibility of knowing the in itself. And he found a rather intriguing way uh, which starts with the observation that uh, our bodies ha are very uh, ambiguous objects. Uh, on the one hand, they are uh, phenomena, empirical objects like everything else. So if I look at my hand, I see it as extended in space. I could calculate its position uh, compared to a table, compared to a microphone and so forth. There's nothing different uh, with, uh, say, the microphone itself. Uh, and that's representational knowledge. On the other hand, I also have, he says, this inner access to my body. So I know where my hand is in space without any calculation. I know what it feels to have a hand, I'm, as opposed to having a foot, for example. I know whether I'm in pain or not. So uh, Schopenhauer thinks that this inner access, so to speak, to the body uh, is a form of non-representational knowledge, which therefore can bypass the Kantian prohibition. And it works, he says, as an access to, uh, to the citadel of the uh, in itself, 
And if I focus on this um, intuitive um, access to my body, then what I discover, he thinks, is that I'm nothing but a set of desires and drives. And these desires and drives he calls uh, the will. And then in book two of his major uh, opus, The World as Will and Representation, he proceeds to extend this insight to the whole world. So not just our bodies, not just us, but everything in the phenomenal world is what he calls an objectification of the will. And he has, so for animals, for example, they, like us, have desires. They want to live fundamentally. Plants try to grow. Uh, And he even comes up with interesting examples like crystals, which are for him halfway between the mineral and the, uh, the vegetal world, and who also sh- which also show an aspiration to grow. So he comes to this conclusion, anti-Kantian conclusion, that it is possible to know uh, the, ins- the noumenal world, although not through representational knowledge, and its name, its essence, is will. That was terrific. I'm going to go back a bit now. Though. Sure. <laughs> Just to sort of, that's, that, that, that's a wonderful covering the course. But Anthony, Anthony Grayling, so we still, uh, he, he's, he's with the Kantian idea, he's challenging that part of the Kantian idea, as Beatrice has outlined so very lucidly. But let's just go back to his first serious work, was called The Principle of Sufficient Reason. Is that an important work to start with? It was his first really public. What's important about it as far as Schopenhauer's concerned? It was his doctoral dissertation yes. and, and his first publication, in fact, self published. Yes, uh, the, the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason, uh, it was called, a magnificent title. And it was uh, a, a, an examination, really, of the idea that um, causality, the concept of causality, and the idea that uh, uh, everything that is uh, has to have been produced by some antecedent uh, set of conditions um, have very important implications for his later thought. The idea is that uh, 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 anything which is the case has been produced by a set of conditions which is sufficient for making it the case, and that therefore the thing thus produced follows from its ground by necessity. This turned out to be very important later on because in in, in a very um, uh, sophisticated analysis of the notion of free will, which perhaps we'll we'll come on to later on, uh, it provided him with um, his reason for thinking that all individual actions are causally necessitated have to be even though that left room for an idea of overall responsibility premised on our character but uh, the um, examination of the idea of grounds and of the relation of grounds to what follows from them the idea of the sufficient and necessary conditions which would have to be invoked in an explanation of anything that is produced that's the subject of that dissertation Christopher January, let's let's now come to his his great work, an early early great work, as is often the case with. Well, never mind. Um, which Beatrice is talking about the the idea of the will. Can you uh, take us on from where Beatrice took us to to do, take that a bit further and emphasise what it is, so our listeners know exactly what we can be talking about for for the rest of the program. Okay, well, uh, Schopenhauer suggests that, or very strongly uh, argues that the essence of everything uh, is will. And I think probably the the nearest we can get to this is the idea that everything is in some way striving or trying or tending in a direction. The difficulty with this notion is that he thinks that for most for the most part this is a blind striving. Uh, so nature is not conscious; it doesn't have desires in the the literal sense that human beings do uh, with their conscious minds. However, he thinks that everything in nature is of one kind in the sense that everything is in some way striving to be something. Um, And indeed, even in human beings, a lot of the will is unconscious or it's um, the way that our body uh, functions to fulfill needs and interests that we have. We're not consciously um, making our heart beat or digesting things or, uh, and so on. But he sees all this as a way of, of striving, a way of the will trying to keep itself alive. Um, he also um, thinks that reproduction is uh, part of this. And indeed, the expression, uh, which is often translated as will to life, um, is very crucial to his philosophy. It's not just the will to live, as it could also be translated. It's also the will to produce life. So he actually sees that uh, one of our the primary drive of human beings is not only to survive, but to reproduce themselves. And he gives a, a great importance to uh, sexuality um, uh, under the heading of reproduction. Um, and he thinks that 
the, the very important thing for human beings is that this is our essence. Our essence is really not rationality. Uh, rationality distinguishes us from other animals, but it just makes us cleverer at uh, attaining the things we strive for. But it's the striving, this, the, the neediness, um, that uh, really is our essence, is really what is impelling us along. And there's a big switch here from earlier philosophy, particularly Enlightenment philosophy, that sees reason as somehow the essence of human beings. He's very much against that idea. Um, Beatrice Sandpal, can you can we take this even further and push into this? This, as I understand it, he tells us this this will is both infinite and meaningless. If that's right, can you tell us why he thinks that? Yes. Well, uh, there's there's really two things. The first is that uh, he doesn't believe in uh, satisfaction of desire. He thinks that at best uh, a desire may be satisfied for a short time, uh, but then what will happen is that immediately another desire will uh, emerge. So the thought is that uh, this striving that Chris was uh, talking about is infinite. There's no end point which we could reach, and that's probably another of his uh, lines of opposition with Hegel. Uh, there's no progress, there's no end point that we could reach where we could rest so to speak, and desire, uh, desire would be satisfied. In fact, he does, in, he does mention cases which could look like that. So when we are satisfied and we stay satisfied for a while, but then what happens, he thinks, is boredom. Uh, and uh, the satisfaction of desire itself becomes painful, so to speak. And he has these, uh, this great formula saying that life oscillates like a pendulum between uh, desire and boredom, uh, which each in their way uh, are uh, painful. So uh, it's this uh, endless character of desire which also makes it meaningless because whatever we achieve, there is the sense that uh, this is just a drop of water in the sea of desire, so to speak. There's no end state, no ultimate goal for, uh, for the will. It is just endlessly, blindly, as Chris said, uh, striving. And the best it can hope for, so to speak, is to become aware of itself in its higher phenomena, namely human beings. But I guess we'll, we'll get back to that. Well, I think we're going to try to get someone near that now with Anthony Grayling. Um, can you tell us how he was... I, I mentioned it and we went whiz past it. We didn't stop at that bus stop, Plato. Uh, but you talked a bit about Kant. But another big influence on him, remarkably for the time, and perhaps even uniquely for a Western philosopher, were the Upanishads. Uh, and he brought Oriental thought, I might say, as much of philosophy. How did the uh, Buddhism and uh, the Hindu Vedantic philosophy play into what he was trying, or what he was saying about the will, Anthony? It's first necessary just to uh, remark that um, understanding of uh, Indian philosophy in the early 19th century was still in a nascent stage, it was still just emerging, which is why when people talk about Schopenhauer and his interest in that um, <clears throat> they, they tend to run together two separable things, although they do have connections, that is <clears throat> between Vedanta, which is associated with the Upanishads and the tradition of what you might or later came to be called Hindu thought on the one hand and Buddhism on the other which is a, a separate thing although it does have great commonalities with the early and middle uh, Upanishads um, the, the key similarity between Schopenhauer's thought and uh, Indian thought is with Buddhism with the idea that striving, yearning, restlessness is a cause of suffering and that therefore the character of the world, the character of experience in the world is suffering and that the only way that one can escape suffering, according to the Buddhist tradition, is to cease to will, to cease to, uh, to, to strive and to yearn and to desire. And this denial of the will, this uh, uh, refusal to be driven on into suffering by the will, is the source, the root of escape. And uh, Schopenhauer very much agrees with that. Now, he arrived at this view independently, I think. I, I think when he was uh, doing his early work and beginning work in his 20s on the world as will and representation, he wasn't uh, that aware. But when he did become aware of those Upanishads, which are the texts of the Vedanta tradition, um, he immediately recognised a, a similarity of thought and uh, sort of embraced it, claimed that uh, he read uh, one or two of the verses of the Upanishads every night for the rest of his life. 
Yes, he did indeed. Um, it actually was quite early. He was given uh, a copy of the of, of a rather strange Latin translation of the Upanishads when he was quite young, and it did almost become like a Bible for him. So he had early knowledge of the Upanishads while he was writing the world as well. I only found out about Buddhism later, and then was very pleased to find that there was a convergence. Just can we um, de- develop this on what? Can you give us some idea of, of, of what more specifically he's taking from the Upanishads and how, how it's matching in with his, his views uh, that he's taken from Kant and so on? Are these spliced together or, or does one grow out of the other? I don't know what I don't think they are they are, uh, they are spliced together yes uh, the uh, I guess the main idea is really the one that uh, Anthony was uh, explaining namely uh, the thought that there's no sin satisfaction is not a durable satisfaction and cessation of pain is not really uh, possible uh, the only uh, way out for us so to speak is uh, and for the will itself is self-denial renunciation that certainly one uh, aspect. There's another important aspect, I think, in his ethical theory, um, because one of the fundamental Buddhist ideas is that harming others is fundamentally uh, harming oneself, and we should be aware of that. Now, in the fourth book of The Will uh, as World and Representation, Schopenhauer develops an idea which is very similar. Uh, he says that uh, when one thinks about uh, the contrast between the essence of the world and uh, the phenomenal world, what one finds is that although the world at its heart is just one, it's the will, uh, at the phenomenal level, the level in which we live, the everyday level, uh, what we see is endless strife uh, and war. And just, you know, just by, in order to stay alive, we have to destroy things, we eat animals, we eat plants and so forth. And we all end out, he thinks, with a sort of fundamental egotism, which places us at the center of our universe. So, uh, and that is, um, of course, a, a severe cause of unhappiness and conflict. And the thought he takes from Buddhism is that through compassion, it is possible to uh, realize that uh, our essence is the same as that uh, of all other phenomena, and that therefore these phenomenal strife, uh, strifes uh, which agitate the empirical world could be uh, overcome if we uh, identified with other beings and realized that in harming them, we harm each other, no, we harm ourselves as well. Christopher Jan, does he think that recognizing the will um, can teach us how to live, Schopenhauer? Is he is his aim to teach us how to live, or is his aim just to examine the world as it is, and that's what his aim is, and we take from it what we want to? Well, I think his aim is <coughs> indeed to uh, give us a reorient our description of the world and our, our sense of what we are. Mm. Um, the very fundamental thing that Beatrice has touched on is the idea that somehow being an individual isn't ultimate. I mean, being an individual is in some way you're under a bit of an illusion that you, the individual, matter um, any more than anything else. Uh, And indeed, in some sense, the individual is illusory. If you go down to the level of what things are in themselves, beyond the, the phenomenal level, there are no individuals. I mean, his metaphysics suggest that the thing in itself can't be divided, the world, the world as it is in itself, what its real essence is, uh, can't be divided up into separate things at all. So there's a sense in which uh, myself, the individual that I find myself as, isn't fundamental at all. I think that's an important thing that he wants us to think. It's a very um, tough uh, message in a way. Um, he thinks. So what is important? Yep, Can you elaborate yep. that a bit? I mean, is he, is he saying something like, oh, well, he is also very early on saying animals are just as important, plants are just as important. He's saying that com- compared with, as it were, uh, what other people are saying at the time, very early yes. on. This, uh, he's abolished all hierarchies completely. Um, yes, in terms of value, yes. Mm. Um, as I said, I think, before, that uh, there's a big difference between ourselves and other animals in that we have reason. Reason enables us to um, make judgments, uh, have logical arguments, uh, be motivated by thoughts about the future, thoughts about the past. Animals live in a continual present um, and are quite different from us in that way. But it doesn't make them... Well, A, it doesn't make human beings any happier because uh, as well as suffering from the present, we suffer from our anxieties about the future and our guilt and remorse about the past, which animals are free from. Also, it doesn't make us any ethically any more valuable. It makes us more liable to do harm because we're cleverer. 
you know, we can uh, we can take great steps to um, to uh, um, elaborately um, harm other beings, which uh, animals can't. Um, and also, we don't have any greater moral worth by virtue of being rational, because the whole point about morality is uh, it's about suffering, as Beatrice has said. Animals suffer because they will. They have desires, they have needs. Those desires can be thwarted, and hence they suffer just as much as we do. So ethically, we're on a par with other animals. And in fact, Schopenhauer, certainly in his later, in his, his later works, he discovers quite a lot about um, societies for the prevention of cruelty to animals, particularly in Britain. He is, one thing about Britain that he's very uh, praises very much is that it, it has this concern for animals, and there's, you know, in the early 19th century there are beginning to be these societies to protect them, and he thinks uh, it's scandalous how animals are treated. He mentions vivisection and uh, the use of animals to, as beasts of burden and so on, and in this way he seems to be actually very contemporary with us, his concern for animal welfare. Anthony, can we... Can we get back to this idea of what is unknowable, the noumenal, and how, why Schopenhauer thought that there were ways to know the unknowable? Um, can we talk about it in terms of sexual desire, for instance, which he, as, as Christopher said early on in the programme, was a big part of what he wrote, and how the appetites might take us there? Can you just get that? I don't think we've talked about it enough. I don't think the people listening... Well, let's talk about me. And I've got a clear enough idea of what the numeral, numeral is and how it is he pulled it into a possible area of knowledge. Chris reminded me uh, just before the programme, as it happens, that uh, Kant, uh, that uh, Schopenhauer himself didn't like the word numeral itself. He always used the expression thing in itself. So, well, we'll uh, stick, stick to that one. The thing in itself. The thing in itself. The, the idea here is that um, everything that appears to us in the phenomenal world, as Beatrice has described, uh, is both something for us because of the nature of our cognitive capacities of how we perceive and conceive it, but it is also uh, something that uh, has a nature... Uh, in itself. And in the Kantian philosophy, this is sealed off from us. All we can know about it are some negative things, namely that they don't obey the categories of thought that constitute the phenomenal world for us. But the key, the key thing, again, is, as Beatrice told us earlier, is that we have access to this, to, to the thing in itself, through our own experience of, of willing. Um, that there is some scholarly dispute here, and, and Chris would be the Chris, Chris and Beatrice would be the experts on this about whether what we actually get in touch with is the thing in itself, will, uh, through our experience of willing, or whether our own experience of willing brings us as close as it's possible for us to get to the ultimate metaphysical reality. But let's just just take it that we get into direct contact with this underlying metaphysical reality of all things through our own experience of desiring, of yearning, of having these urgencies, one of which of course is indeed sexual desire because the, a tremendous feature of, of the universe is this, this will to life, to continuation not just, as, as Chris pointed out to being alive or staying alive but also to producing more life the, one of the big influences as it may be, even if it's indirect on Freud, is the idea that this unconscious sexual drive is a powerful determinant of what we are and of our experience. But it is that, it's the fact that we feel uh, our appetites, that we are driven by them, that uh, it's very hard, it's hard work, as, as Chris pointed out earlier on, to do the work of self-denial. Uh, that is our most direct, palpable recognition of the underlying reality of things, the will. But is he actually saying that sexual desire and sexual consummation in themselves are a, nu are a thing, are a noumenal experience which then brings us back into an area where we can describe what is supposed to be unknowable? Well, the, the presence of any kind of desire and yearning, and sexual desire would be a, a particularly uh, notable feature of it, uh, is uh, our experience of the of the things in of the, the 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 thing in itself, which is this underlying metaphysical reality. Sexual consummation is a quite different thing, and it would only ever be at best a temporary cessation of that appetite, because it would soon recur, depending upon how energetic one is. So it would be be in part um, a feature of this of the the sort of infinitude of the limitlessness of of the yearning, the striving, the willing that causes our experience of suffering. Chris, yeah. Um, it has, um, there's a very important essay that he wrote in the second volume as, of The World as Will and Representation in 1844 on the metaphysics of sexual love, and uh, it's, it's a, a very, uh, quite a well-read text. Um, he suggests that 
um, we experience desire as an individual for another individual. So it's on the phenomenal level that this all occurs. But we're under, again, we're under kind of illusion that really uh, it's me, this individual, desiring this other individual. What's really happening underneath is that our essence, our nature, which is common to the rest of the world, is kind of driving us on. We're kind of pushed along by this, um, this striving, this will, uh, which we're kind of at the mercy of. We're, we're imprisoned by it. We're, say, yes, we're, we're imprisoned by it. it, it um, we, even if we try to shut, out, shut it out and get on with our intellectual life, it, it always keeps intruding into um, our thoughts. I think there's a bit of a, a personal uh, uh, confession here that uh, his sexual desires were very strong and he found it very hard to accommodate them to his, uh, his intellectual persona, I think. Um, but that's perhaps another another story. But romantic love is a kind of illusion uh, that uh, disappears, he says, as soon as we possess the individual we desire, we realise that it's just any old sexual desire. Yeah, just on this, uh, he actually says that love is a trick of nature to ensure the reproduction of a species. So any, you know, higher, what we might thought of uh, as uh, higher feelings uh, are just illusory. What the, the bottom line is, the species has to go on beyond the individuals and nature will do anything that ensures this, including uh, generating feelings of love uh, in these individuals. We've talked fleetingly about self-denial or getting outside oneself in <coughs> using oriental uh, philosophies to <coughs> as a guide towards that but he also thought that one relief one escape was art particularly music can you tell us why uh, he thought that music was a way to escape um, the swing between uh, pain and boredom well, music is an interesting case. For Schopenhauer, it's at the top of his hierarchy of the arts. And what makes it uh, special is that uh, it's the only art in which uh, we have a, a direct attunement, if you like, to the essence of the world. And we can feel that in the way music moves us directly, without the need for visual representations, without the need for words. The thought is that when we hear music, we uh, this sort of materializes... Uh, the, the dries that are at work in, in the world. And he actually uh, then correlates uh, the various, um, uh, you know, the, the bass, the uh, treble and so forth to uh, the great forces in, in the universe. So music is really uh, the, the most immediate of all the arts, of, of all the arts, the one in which uh, we can feel, so to speak, uh, our noumenal essence uh, in, in, in the highest uh, and most uh, powerful way. And most uh, outstandingly, Wagner uh, read Schopenhauer uh, massively, we're told, in the middle of the 19th century when he wasn't composing or composing very little indeed. Uh, and partly because of, of the privileging, as you, you people say these days, of, of music and took it into his music and tried to use the philosophy to help him write the music. Yes, so after the 1848 uh, um, revolution, which uh, Wagner had taken part in, he was on the barricades, he ran away to Switzerland, all his colleagues on the barricades had been put in prison, and uh, he spent a number of years thinking, um, rethinking, really, his approach to, to music and, and to opera. And it was what, and he, they began work on the ring, and uh, he had written the libretto for the entire ring, had begun work on the music for the first uh, uh, two um, parts of the ring when he encountered Schopenhauer. Now he, him, for the rest of his life, uh, he read Schopenhauer, he talked about Schopenhauer, he discussed it with Cosima, you look at Cosima's diaries, there's uh, an enormous number of references to Schopenhauer in Wagner's speech. But the an underlying ground note of all that is that what Wagner felt when he read Schopenhauer was that here was somebody who articulated what he himself had already felt. That is, that music is this, the ultimate expression when it expresses sorrow and joy and love and ecstasy, it's not the sorrow, joy, love, ecstasy of a particular individual or a moment, but sorrow, joy, ecstasy itself. It, it's it's a absolutely an expression of, uh, of the metaphysical realities. And so he was there he was, right in the middle of writing The Ring, hadn't really begun to write the, the music uh, for the um, at least the last two parts of The Ring, um, but he had to stop and write a different opera, Tristan and Isolde, which is the perhaps the, the best, purest expression of, a, of the application of those ideas that Wagner recognised and found a resonance in Schopenhauer to Wagner's own work. It is, that is par excellence, if you like, the Schopenhauer uh, um, opera that Wagner wrote.
Can I just direct, sorry, Chris, can I just say, can you give us just a few more names whom he influenced deeply? Because it seems to me from the reading for this program, it is, his ideas did gather force and sweep through the late 19th and way into the 20th century with some strong figures taking that's him right. up well, or taking him on. You know? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the most obvious is Nietzsche, who um, read Schopenhauer avidly in the, in the way that Wagner did and, in fact, shared this passion with Wagner, who he knew. Um, but then Nietzsche came to see um, the, the resignationism and the self-denial and the illusoriness of the individual as really um, a kind of um, intellectual illness that uh, Europe was suffering from. And I think, in my view, much of Nietzsche's philosophy is built around an opposition to these ideas, the idea of affirmation of life, um, of becoming properly the individual that you are, rather than self-denial. So I, th I think that's the most important influence. We've mentioned Freud briefly. Um, Freud himself said it was remarkable how his ideas had been um, prefigured by Schopenhauer. Uh, we've mentioned the the um, prominence of sexual desire in Schopenhauer's account. Somehow the essence of the human being is a drive towards uh, sexual uh, intercourse. That was very um, echoed by Freud. But also, um, Schopenhauer has an interesting um, prefiguring of Freud's notion of repression. Um, and he thinks that um, there's a kind, of, uh, a kind of madness in which painful memories uh, get eradicated by the mind and, and some illusory uh, content is replaced with it. Freud recognised that as a prefiguring of his own idea of repression. Beatrice, the other, he influenced quite a number of writers, think of Hardy and Lawrence and Camus, and they, they seem to have taken him on board quite strongly. So the, did he, in that sense, you think of somebody who really did prefigure what was going to happen in the following years, or did they take him up and... Be, which way did it work? Well, let's take the example of, uh, of Camus, and in particular what Camus said uh, about the absurd. Uh, he said he read philosophy, uh, and uh, he took two ideas from Schopenhauer. One is that uh, ultimately life is meaningless and the other is that we're doomed to suffer and he put that in what he he called the, uh, the paradox of the absurd namely on the one hand we're bound to look for meaning in our lives that's just what we do and on the other hand if we take uh, a cold hard look at the universe then we see it's uh, there's no ultimate meaning there I'm and sorry I have to, oh, sure. my fault, I've completely messed up the timing, thank you Mr. <laughs> and Pyle, Anthony Grayling, Christopher January next week, what is it, uh, Siege of Monster thanks for listening If you've enjoyed this BBC podcast why not try others such as Start the Week the Radio 4 discussion programme where Andrew Marr sets the cultural agenda for the next seven days. To find out more, visit bbc.co.uk forward slash podcasts.